Hello and welcome to another video on Baldur's Gate 3. In this one I'm going to go through the basics of character creation for those that come to Baldur's Gate 3 without having played it in early access and never created characters in D&D before. If you've done either of these things before, nothing in this video should come as a surprise. So let's begin by talking about what the goals of creating a character in Baldur's Gate 3 is. What do you want to have once you lock in your choices and begin your adventure? There are two things to focus on in my opinion. The first thing is you want to create a character that is good at the right things. Obvious, I know, but how do you do that? Baldur's Gate 3 is built upon the rules of D&D 5th edition, which means that every time the game decides whether you succeed or fail at something, it will do so by rolling a 20-sided die. The harder the thing is to do, the higher score you'll need, and the better you are at that specific thing, the higher bonuses you'll get to that roll. Let's say you want to kick in a door to a burning building. It's a sturdy door and the fact that there's fire all around you doesn't help. You'll need to roll a 12 or higher to kick the door down. But, since you're a strong half-orc barbarian, you get a plus 3 to the dice roll. The things that determine whether you'll get a bonus to your roll or not and how much that'll be are your proficiencies and your ability scores. We'll cover both of them a little later. The second thing to consider is pure roleplay. Who are you? What drives you? because while everything you pick in the character creator has a mechanical implication, like giving you proficiencies in certain skills or bonuses to your ability score, they also have story implications. Like Sven Vinke, the head of Larian, said himself, you can't be a completionist. There's no way you can see everything in this game, and the reason for that is that there are countless dialogue options that can only be unlocked if you are a certain race or class or have a specific background. It's fascinating how much there is in this game that feels tailored to fit your specific character regardless of what you choose. Oh, and if it's huh. concern, you're brave to walk around without hiding your heritage. I'll make sure everyone knows that you helped us at the gate. That's awesome. That wouldn't happen if I didn't play it right. I, there's there's so much reactivity to what type of character you play. So my advice going into the creation of your first character is to let this be the main focus. There's no class that's outright bad or skills that you can't play the game with or without. You shouldn't worry about creating the right character. Create the character that's right for you. I know that's a cliche, but it doesn't make it any less true. With that said, let's take a look at all the things you'll need to choose and what they mean. Let's start off by talking about proficiencies. In the game, there are a ton of skills. You don't pick what skills you have. Skills can be athletics, acrobatics, stealth, performance, history, and so on. Depending on what race, class, and background you pick, you'll be proficient in some of these skills, meaning you'll get a bonus to every role you make in that skill. For example, staying hidden when you sneak is a stealth role, while trying to lift a heavy object is an athletics role. You can still try to do these things, even if you aren't proficient in the skill, you may very well succeed, but the chance is higher if you are. Picking a race is important because it comes with certain benefits. However, the devs announced a meaningful change to races that came with the release of the game. In D&D 5e and in Early Access of BG3, each race gave you plus two to a certain ability and plus one to another certain ability. For example, the dwarf gave you plus two to constitution and plus one to another certain ability depending on what subrace you picked. Whereas gnomes or halflings would give you bonuses in other certain abilities. In Baldur's Gate 3, you can pick any ability to give plus 2 to and any ability to give plus 1 to. Meaning you could be a super smart half orc or a freakishly strong gnome. While this opens up for more freedom in picking a race, some have said that this makes the decision of your race feel a little less meaningful. However, that is far from every benefit you get from picking your race and it's still the case that some races and especially their sub-races do fit better with certain classes. For example, the half orc has savage attacks, which lets them deal more damage on a critical hit with a melee weapon than any other race in the game. So yeah, you could make a half orc wizard with a boatload of intelligence, but your savage attack would be kinda wasted. That being said, please make a half orc wizard and send me a clip, that would be awesome. To sum 
sum up races, make sure to check what benefits you get from your race and your sub race. Some of you will probably be more interested in a certain race going into character creation, while others might go in excited to play a specific class. Depending on what benefits you get, there are certain races that fit better with certain classes and vice versa. When it comes to classes, it's pretty much the same thing. Different classes will unlock different things. They give you different proficiencies, and different classes have access to different spells and abilities. Important to note is that some classes demand that you choose a subclass right away in character creation, while others have subclasses that unlock a few levels into the game. So if you're creating a character and some of them don't have subclasses right away, don't worry, they'll be there later. If you have trouble deciding on what class you should choose, I've made a video that goes over my three favorite classes from playing almost 200 hours in Early Access. You could watch that and see if any of those three classes could be something for you. Other than that, just read through what each class gives you and pick what seems fun. Like I said before, you're not gonna sit there 30 hours into the game and think that it's unplayable because you picked the weakest class. They're all good in their own way. And if you sit there and think to yourself, wow, that John guy was full of crap, my class sucks, you will be able to respec should you want to. Moving on to background, here you'll get to pick who your character has been before the beginning of this grand adventure. Are you an entertainer who's played your loot on the streets and in taverns? Or are you a sage who have spent your days in libraries studying books and tomes full of knowledge? Have you been a folk hero? Perhaps you are the person I talked about earlier who kicked down that door to the burning building and was respected in your hometown for saving the Jenkins family. And these backgrounds matter. They can unlock dialogue options like I talked about earlier. They give you proficiencies in certain skills. For example, the entertainer is proficient in acrobatics and performance, while the sage is proficient in arcana and history. On top of that, these backgrounds can give you inspiration points. If you have inspiration points, you can use them to re-roll a dice if you don't get the desired outcome. In other words, they're really good to have. The way you get an inspiration point is to do things that go along with your background. If you're a folk hero, you might get an inspiration point from saving the Jenkins family from that burning building. So while getting proficiencies are great, make sure you pick a background that fits with the kind of person you want your character to be. That way it's likely you'll end up making decisions that grant you inspiration points without even thinking about it. On to abilities. In the game we have strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom and charisma. The higher your ability score is, the better your ability score modifier becomes, which is what matters when you roll the dice. If you have 10 in an ability, your modifier is 0. If you have 8 or 9, your modifier is minus 1. If you have 12 or 13, your modifier becomes plus 1. 14 and 15, plus 2, and so on and so forth. These pluses or minuses is what you apply to rolls based on that ability. In other words, you want a high ability score in the ability your class uses the most. If you're a fighter, your primary ability is strength. If you're a wizard, your primary ability is intelligence and a rogue has dexterity. When you pick a class, the game tells you what their most important abilities are. And it'll have a default allocation of ability points that also are a good indicator of what abilities are important to your character. However, be mindful of whether allocating an extra point in an ability affects your modifier or not. Going from 12 to 13 in an ability won't change your modifier from plus 1 to plus 2, so in a way, that point is wasted. This isn't entirely true, of course, since you'll be able to add points to your abilities as you level up. So putting yourself one point away from the next step on your modifier can be worth it, you'll just have to wait a while before you get that benefit. So we've already talked about skills. Different things you attempt in the game will require you to roll to see if you succeed. Let's say you're in a conversation and need to convince someone that you should be allowed to pass. If you have 14 charisma, you'll get a plus two to all roles that involve talking your way into or out of things. If you also want your character to be a devious trickster, you can choose to be proficient in the skill deception, meaning that if you try to deceive rather than persuade, you'll get an extra bonus to that role. When you've chosen your background, race and class, you'll already be proficient in a couple of skills and some other skills will be available for you to be proficient in. So go through that list and see what skills you'd like your character to be good at. Once again, not being proficient in a skill doesn't stop you from using it. It's not like not being proficient in acrobatics means you can't jump. You're just not very good at it. Something to be mindful of is what weapons and armor your character is proficient at using. Using gear you're not proficient in will make combat a lot harder on you than you want it to be. Alright, now all you need to do is spend 3-5 to five hours customizing the appearance of your character and then you're good to go. If you watched this video, I hope you found it helpful. 
If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps us small creators out a lot. I hope you'll have an amazing time in Baldur's Gate 3 with your first character and that you didn't count how many times I used the word certain throughout the course of this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.